Thank you all for being here tonight. My name is Michael Ulrich, and I am the director of NYU Washington, D.C. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the Abramson Family Auditorium for tonight's event. If you didn't see the full film or want to see it again, or probably recommend it to all of your friends and family, it will be playing again on WETA on May 8th at 10 p.m. That's May 8th at 10 p.m. on WETA. NYU Washington, D.C.'s fifth annual Weisberg Forum for Discourse in the Public Square will focus on criminal justice reform. A special thanks to Nina Weisberg, whose generosity established a signature event to bring together distinguished figures from government, industry, professions, and the academy to dis discuss complex and timely issues. Tonight, we are honored to welcome the president and founder of Just Leadership USA, Glenn E. Martin. Glenn challenges the assumptions that formerly incarcerated people lack the skills to thoughtfully weigh in on policy reform and works to amplify the voice of most of these impacted by positioning them as reform leaders. Leading by example, Glenn himself spent six, year, six years incarcerated in a New York State prison in the early 1990s. He went on to co-found a number of re-entry and reform organizations and movements, including the hashtag Close Rikers campaign. Please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Ms. Glenn E. Martin, to the stage. Good evening. Let me try that again. <laughs> Came all the way down from New York. Good evening. Hey. <laughs> How's it going? Uh, so I'm glad to be here. I remember uh, sitting with Bill Moyers uh, shortly after uh, this film was made and uh, reviewing the film and saying a couple of things to him. One, I remember I said, every story in this, uh, in this film rings true to me based on my experience in the criminal justice system. And the second thing was the importance of, you know, a person like Morius could have included his voice throughout this film. He could have found other people to narrate this film. But he allowed the people who were most affected by Rikers to actually tell their own story. And it's something I've been saying ever since I exited prison 15 years ago, that people closest to the problem are closest to the solution. And unfortunately, most times, furthest from power and resources. And so I really appreciate this film because Rikers actually tells its own story in my experience. So some of the things that don't show up in the film that I think are important, and then I'll try to give you a sense of why I'm the speaker for this evening and talk a little bit about the work that I do. 11 million admissions happen in our jails in this country each year. So we talk about 2.3 million people in prison. We talk about 70 million Americans having a criminal record on file. We talk about the 630,000 people who exit our criminal justice system each year. And often the type of human carnage that is caused by our jail system gets lost in this country, those 11 million admissions that happen each year. And here at Rikers, you know, when I was at Rikers, there were 22,000 people. Today, there's about 8,000 people there on any given day. And yet, uh, you lose sight of the type of, uh, the amount of harm that's caused by Rikers if you don't take a look at the churn, the actual amount of admissions. And at Rikers, it's about 62,000 each year. It is down from 125,000 where it was years ago, and I think that that creates an opportunity to behave dif for New York City to behave differently, to do things differently, to reimagine its criminal justice system. But I'll talk more about that in a second. A little bit about Rikers itself. You know, in New York, we have about eight and a half million people. Uh, most people will never go to Rikers. Most people will never bump into Rikers. Most people, when they fly out of LaGuardia Airport, even though it's 200 feet away from Rikers Island, will never actually look down and either see it or realize what it is that they're seeing. There is a bridge, one way on, one way off. It is uh, the longest bridge in anyone's life. Um, one might argue that you leave the Constitution at the other side of it when you're on your way to Rikers. There are 10 jails there. You get to the top of the bridge and you look down. It's one of the most intimidating sights. I went there as a 16-year-old. I want to talk a little bit about that and what that was like. Um, but some more st statistics about Rikers. 40% of the people that are there have a mental health diagnosis. 12% of them have serious and persistent uh, mental health issues. 89% people of color. 80% not convicted of a crime. Detainees awaiting trial. 
there are 10,000 officers for 10,000 uh, inmates slash detainees. That doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. That doesn't exist in places like Norway, where people serve time in prisons that are much more humane than Rikers Island. And we spend $247,000 per bed per year to run this institution. Violence at Rikers has gone up every single year between 2008 and 2016. Our mayor, Mayor de Blasio in New York, one of the most progressive mayors, has invested $500 million to try to curb the violence at Rikers, and violence is up 18% during the time that he's invested that $500 million. When I started the campaign to close Rikers a year ago, we were spending about $209,000 per bed per year. This morning, we had a rally on the steps of City Hall, 350 people. I was looking at the signage, and now we're up to, as I mentioned a second ago, $247,000 per year. What would make this mayor think that he'd be able to do what every other mayor did before him and have a different outcome. Every other mayor has decided that the way to clean up Rikers is to invest more resources. And yet, as someone who served on uh, the Lippman Commission, which was a commission created by our speaker a year ago, independent commission, to take a look at our criminal justice system in New York, I've learned a lot about how we got here. And I've learned a lot about how difficult it'll be for New York to get out of this mess. But I want folks who are sitting in this room to realize that Rikers is every jail, and every jail is Rikers. And if you're here in DC, there's a conversation happening now about a new jail, a public-private venture to run a jail here. And you should get involved and ask yourself, is there any role that you can play in the decision making before the mayor here uh, in DC gets to the point of deciding what this jail is going to look like? what service is going to be offered, who's going to be running this institution. At Rikers, we have a jail that started as 82 acres of land. It was purchased from the Riken family, a family that used to capture slaves and return them to the South. It's now 420 acres. We just continue to build and build and build. So most of it is actually landfill. And so people say to me all the time, when I said a year ago we should close Rikers, it was the first time I had said it out loud in front of an audience, but not the first time. Can I move away from the mic? Yeah. But not the first time that I had said it to our mayor. So I was at the mayor's inauguration, and I said to him, Mr. Mayor, we should, we should close Rikers. And this was within 10 minutes of him becoming mayor. And the mayor said to me, he said, well, why do you say that? And we talked for one or two minutes. And I remember in that one or two minutes, he continued to ask why over and over and over again. And as someone who went to Rikers when I was 16 and experienced Rikers again when I was 23, I couldn't understand how this mayor, who had lived in this city for so long, didn't understand that Rikers Island had become the repository for people who had failed out of all of these other policies that he had hoped to solve. I mean, if you look at the data, it's clear. If you look at homelessness, which is something he cares a lot about, People go from Rikers to the homeless shelter, back to Rikers, back to the homeless shelter. And if you look at our health care policies, you see the same uh, sort of rotation of people from one system into the other. But when I said out loud we should close Rikers, even many of my progressive colleagues said, there's just no way. And I had a hard time understanding how people had gotten to the point where they couldn't use their imagination to imagine a city without an island like Rikers Island. And if we couldn't get it done in a city like New York, where in the country would we really end up ending mass incarceration? And so what I decided was to do the work the way I've always done the work, which is that the investment in the people who have the most stake in the outcome, to me, seems like the right place to make your most significant investment if you want to get to the finish line. And so we went off and we built the Close Rikers campaign and we started on the steps of City Hall about 12 months ago today. And there were 50 organizations that supported us. And we sent a clear message to the mayor that there was a constituency that was going to be built to shut down Rikers. And we thought that our mayor right away would get it. I mean, this was already three years since he had uh, run for mayor and became mayor in New York City. And here was a chance for him to have a constituency to support him to shut down the facility. And yet the mayor said that it was a noble cause, but that he would continue to invest in Rikers. 
And we said to ourselves, when they, well, then we need to create a situation that makes it politically unstable for the mayor to continue to do so. And so we took the voices of people who had served time on Rikers, and we created an opportunity for them to appear in front of audiences like this, for them to appear in front of the media, for them to tell their stories. And we found that the media responded, that the media paid attention, that the media wanted to hear these human stories. And every, every time we asked these folks to come together to send a message to the mayor, they showed up. But why wouldn't they? Because they had the most stake in the outcome of this place shutting down. So one of our leaders, for instance, is a woman named Anna, whose son got arrested for a serious charge for attempted murder. And he is on Rikers Island. He spent six years on Rikers. I think that came up in the film before, where people think of jail, and they say, well, people stay at jail for a few months to a year. But people stay at Rikers for up to six years often as detainees, not convicted of anything. And if that's hard for you to wrap your heads around, then you should take a look at our police system in the United States and our police system in New York. And what is it that motivates people to take a plea, whether they're innocent or guilty or somewhere in between? Because after a year, her son, who had already spent six years on Rikers, who had professed his innocence every single day while he was there, ultimately said, you know what? I can't take this anymore. I can't take the solitary confinement. I can't take the beatings. I can't take the food that we have to eat here. I can't take the fact that my lawyer won't come to visit me, and I'm just going to take a plea. And he took a plea to 10 years to get off Rikers. He said, if I can serve six on Rikers, then I can serve a couple more years upstate to be able to go home. So how do you actually close Rikers? It seems impossible, considering how much we've invested and how far we've come. Well, we have other jails in New York. We have three other jails. We have a jail in Brooklyn, we have a jail in Manhattan, and we have a jail in the Bronx, which is actually on a barge, which is an interesting story in and of itself. When I was in jail at Rikers, buses would pull up to Rikers full of detainees, and the Rikers guards would tell the bus, you can't come on Rikers. We don't have any place to put these people. Like, go drive around the city, and we'll call you and tell you when to come back. The place was always meant to only hold about 14,000 people. When I was there, there were 22,000. Imagine what that was like, being in a situation like that. All of these facilities are outdated. 65% of them were supposed to be taken offline a long time ago. So how did we get the one in the Bronx? Because the commissioner at the time, when we had 22,000 people, knew he needed another jail and didn't want to deal with the land use issues in New York, what it takes to site a new jail, and decided he would just build a jail on a barge and float it all the way up from New Orleans to New York and park it in the Bronx. It was supposed to be offline 20 years ago. It continues to sit there. So why am I so passionate about this? At age 16, I got arrested for shoplifting in New York. It's not a serious charge, but I think a judge wanted to teach me a lesson. And so he decided he would give me $1,500 bail and send me to Rikers Island. He taught me a lesson all right. I got to Rikers. I knew I was going back to court the next day. So I'd be going on my way back to court just 48 hours later. And when I got to Rikers, I think it's Barry in the film who says, you have two choices, predator or prey. My experience was 30 years ago. Some of the people in the film are telling you about an experience from just last year or the year before. So just hold on to that for a minute. That's at least three decades of abuse, particularly for young people at Rikers. Because in New York, we charge 16-year-olds as adults automatically. We finally passed raise the age. But for decades, we were charging 16-year-olds as adults. So I get to Rikers, and I'm in this cell the next day, and I'm going back to court. And the cell is meant to hold about 20 people. But there's about 45, 50 people in this cell. And a young guy comes up to me, and he says, give me your jacket. Like, that's the moment where you have to make a decision about predator or prey. If you give up that jacket, you won't survive at Rikers, period. And so we started to fight. And it felt like minutes, but it must have been just 30 seconds. He and I are fighting. Then I realize I'm fighting three or four people. And then I feel a sharp pain in my back and then in the back of my head, and then here in my neck. And he had a pen that was melted and fashioned into a knife, and he stabbed me the last time and left it in my neck. 
And as I emerged from that fight as a 16-year-old, as a child, he was a child, I was a child. I know we use language like inmate, convict, offender, detainee. We were children. I emerged from that fight knowing I could survive on Rikers. And the most difficult part of it wasn't the fight itself, because it's what I needed to do to show other people on Rikers that I wasn't going to allow anyone to take advantage of me. The most difficult part was the correction officers outside of the cells, chuckling, laughing, and then finally coming in and pulling me out of the cell to put me in another cell and saying to me, if you want medical care, we'll get you medical care, but you won't go to court today. And you might be labeled as a snitch, and you got to come back here tonight and deal with those guys. So that's what that judge taught me, sending me to Rikers. That's what I remembered. Fast forward six, seven years later, I end up back on Rikers. I got a more serious charge this time. I'm going across the bridge. I'm like, I'm not going to be the guy who gets stabbed this time. I'm going to be the guy who does the stabbing. And I remember getting to Rikers, and I remember right away learning how to play the games. I was into gambling. I was using drugs. I was paying correction officers to bring me food, to, take, to let me go down the hall. I had one correction officer. So you hear about all the violence on Rikers. The corruption goes so much further than just the violence. I had a correction officer who would come get me, take me to his office, clean off his desk, show me his work on the computer, get me to do his work, use the phone, eat takeout that he would bring in for me, and he would clean off the desk and go to sleep. So everything I learned about Rikers is that, you know what, I come from a community that was tough, Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, pretty tough community in the 80s and 90s. I come from a community, yes, where people were engaged in criminal behavior, but I had never seen so many crimes as the amount of crimes I saw taking place on Rikers by people who were supposed to be in a role of providing correction and rehabilitation. And that's not to suggest every correction officer is that way. My older brother grew up to be a correction officer. You can imagine what Thanksgiving is like in my home. <laughs> but there was a culture at Rikers that cannot be reformed. And that is why we launched the Close Rikers campaign. That is why we spent so much time convincing the mayor of New York to finally stand up, which he did, it shows it at the end of the film, and say that New York's new policy is to move towards closing Rikers. Because, I mean, I just visited Rikers about seven weeks ago. I'm not even sure why they let me in at this point. I'm surprised that they even let me in the Rikers, but they took us for a tour. And whenever I do tours, I don't want to see what the administration is showing me. I want to see what the guys in the cell want to tell me and what the women who are locked up want to tell me. And so I'm always off the beaten path talking to those folks. And I was in one of these new facilities where they're investing millions of dollars. And they're showing me the uh, uh, enhanced clinical services, the fact that they've put all this new paint, this new light, this, there, there's uh, new televisions and so on. And I look up. And I see a guy in a cell, and he's looking out through the scratchy window, and he's looking down at everyone else at programs. And I just wander off and go up to the top of the tier. And I introduce myself to him. And he said his name was Dante. And I said, Dante, well, why are you not out here programming like everybody else? He's like, I just can't do any programming anymore. And I said, why not? He said, because I've been here six years. I said, what do you mean you've been here six years? Like, Six years, how? Like, are you sentenced? What's going on? He's like, no, just going back and forth to court. Once a month, I go back and forth to court. He's like, I don't know what's going to happen to my case. And I'm just at the point now where I'm like, whatever. Why would I engage in programming? I feel like I have no clue when I'm going to get out of here. And you know, the mayor in New York and his administration would have us believe that things have changed so much now that the advocates need to just slow down on the push to close Rikers and instead realize that the investment that they're making is paying off. And yet, if you speak to anyone who's actually been to Rikers and you ask them about the difference between reforms and shutting it down and starting from scratch, the majority of people who've been there will say to you that there is no reforming Rikers. So then you might say, well, why don't we rebuild on Rikers? You have an island, there's all this space, why don't we just rebuild there? I'll tell you why, because we knew we shouldn't have built there in the first place. It's next to an airport. If you build next to an airport, you have architectural uh, uh, limitations that won't be solved by rebuilding. You have the flight of the airplanes coming in that restricts the height of the buildings. 
a safe jail looks something like this. I'm a correction officer, I'm here. The cells are this way. Recreation is close by, the library is close by. Everything else I need, medication is close by. But that's not what Rikers looks like. Most of the buildings are flat, linear, long hallways with 50 cells. So even if you re rebuild on Rikers, what you're going to end up rebuilding is architecturally a facility that is antithetical to a safe jail, to what we know creates a safe jail. And so that's not just for detainees, that's for correction officers. The knee-jerk reaction of the correction union to the closed Rikers campaign in New York, I'm baffled by it. Because if we have smaller, safer, cleaner, more humane jails in New York City, then they benefit from it also. So how do you get to the finish line? I'm sure we'll talk more about it, but I want to talk about the Lippman Commission for a minute. So last year, I said it was a lonely place when we said we should close Rikers. One person who stood up was the Speaker of the City Council, Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito, and she said, yes, we absolutely should close Rikers. And she always spoke from a place of values. And it wasn't the politically sort of correct thing to do at the time. It didn't score her any points. And yet, she continued to stand up and say, this is the right thing to do, that this facility that turns out so much harm shouldn't exist in our names. And that if you even care about victims, if you say to yourself, well, those are people who committed crimes, what about the victims? That Rikers Island turns out more victimization than any other community in New York. But she knew that there would be a political fight about it, and she decided to create an independent commission. And she asked the chief judge, the former chief judge in New York, Chief Judge Littman, to chair this commission. And she asked him to identify 27 commissioners. And these commissioners are not criminal justice reform folks. They come from all walks of life. Um, one of them is actually a real estate, a huge real estate developer in New York. One's a judge, you name it, across the board, even formerly incarcerated people like myself. And the commission was going to last for a year, just wrapped up its work about a month ago. And as, a, as an advocate, commission translates for me into not now. Like, we'll punt and we'll, we'll do the work at some other point. So when Judge Littman asked me to be on the commission, I had to ask myself, as an advocate, is this a place where I want it to be? Is this a place where I wanted to lend my legitimacy? But what I realized is that there's probably things about Rikers that other people don't know that this commission's going to learn that I need to know as an advocate if we're going to get to the finish line. I decided to be on the commission. And my team at, at Just Leadership USA would constantly sort of ask me, how am I going to motivate the commissioners to come around to my point of view. And I just kept telling them, just chill. Just watch how this works. Because Rikers tells its own story. The data tells its own story. The human beings that have been there help tell that story. The trip to Rikers that we took helps to tell the story. Within nine months, every single commissioner, all 27, unanimously knew that they were going to say we should close Rikers at the end of the 12-month period. Folks who did, some folks who had no clue about criminal justice reform in New York. So as an advocate, I was able to sit back and watch how if we combine good data with good organizing, we could get more and more New Yorkers to understand that this place shouldn't exist. So we have the mayor now saying close Rikers. We have the speaker of the council saying so. We've gotten half the commissioner, the council members to say so. We have the controller in New York saying so. We have the governor saying so. And we have tens of thousands of New Yorkers saying so. But Rikers is still open. And there's been no evidence that we're actually moving towards closing Rikers. So the question is, how do we, how do we get there? Well, you have to cut the population in half. When people say, how do you do that? I say to them, we've already done it. When I was there, there were 22,000 people. Today, there are 10,000. When people say, well, how do we get to half? I say to them, how about Dante sitting in that cell for six years? Forget about what he did. Can we just get him to justice more quickly? Turns out there's about 2,000 people sitting on Rikers, where if we had true speedy trial in New York, they'd get to justice more quickly. Forget about what the outcome is going to be. Let's just get them to justice more quickly. Bail reform. We have nine types of bail in New York. All types. Credit card, unsecured bail, all these different ways that judges can give bail. You know what poor people get? Cash bail. 
So tons of people are sitting on Rikers with bail of less than 2,000. So it's another way to bring the population down by over 1,000. So the first four recommendations of the Littman Commission actually get you to the point where you cut the population in half. And the other 20 plus, I would argue, can probably get you even further. And then you have jails in New York, and you have all this nimbyism, right? You already have some council members saying, not in my backyard. Even some of the ones that say, I support closing Rikers are like, but wait, I don't want a jail in my community. It's laughable. Two of the jails in New York are in two of the most expensive neighborhoods in New York. I mean, granted that it happened through gentrification. They used to be in poorer neighborhoods. But there's a jail downtown Brooklyn where there's million dollar condominiums just a few hundred feet away. I know, I know people would live on top of the jail if you built a condominium on top of the jail. <laughs> and so as, as advocates, we're going to spend, obviously, the next few months uh, convincing council members that while they believe that there's a constituency in their district that's going to push back on them accepting rebuilding jails on the footprint of the existing facilities, that we are going to change the political climate. Because a year ago, the political climate was different. The mayor never would have said, yes, let's close Rikers. We made it that way. The mayor went to a fundraiser in Florida two months ago. We went to a fundraiser in Florida two months ago. Like we made it politically, um, uh, we made it so that the mayor couldn't exist in that political environment until he came around to where we are. And we plan to do that for many council members. So why the investment at the bottom upwards as opposed to most campaigns which build power but spend a lot of time on elected officials, start there. I mean, today was the first time of all of our rallies that we've done that we allowed elected officials to talk at our rally just this morning on the steps of City Hall. Why? I'll tell you why. I want to tell you a quick story, and then I'll stop and open it up to the panel. How much more time do I have? Seven, eight minutes? Just say yeah, and I'll go with it. Thank you. <laughs> so so I'll, tell you, I'll tell you why. So when I was in prison, I spent a year on Rikers, and then I went to state prison. And that year on Rikers was tough, except I was no longer the victim. I was the guy who made sure I had three or four other guys with me, and I was just running the block that we were on. We weren't running it violently, but we were running it. Like, if you came in, we told you when you would use the two phones. We told you when you'd be able to go out to recreation. And the correction officer knew this. He gave us that power. You guys gamble, do what you want. When my sergeant comes around, you need to stop. And then I was on my way to state prison once I got sentenced. I knew I was going to do four or five more years. And I get to state prison, and after a year of surviving on Rikers, I mean, literally on Rikers, you sleep while your friend stays up to make sure you're safe. And then he'll sleep, and you wake up, you stay up to make sure he's safe. So I get to state prison, and they do everything they do. They cut you here. They take your clothing. They take all your belongings. Um, they essentially try to make everyone like everyone else. And, and I get to the actual prison where I'm going to be doing time. And there's a guy he's sitting in a little kitchen area. And there's a microwave. And I was actually shocked that there was any space for people to cook anything. That was so different than what I experienced on Rikers. But he was opening a can of soup. And all I kept thinking to myself was, wow, like the top of that can of soup is going to make a great razor. And wherever he puts that down, I'm going to grab it and I'm going to hide it. Because if you actually take the top of a can and you bend it in half and you cut someone with it, they can't close it because there's two openings side by side. And they're so close together, it's difficult to stitch them together. And I'm looking at this guy and I'm waiting. And he opens the can of soup. And I'm like, he's going to keep that for himself. And he takes, the ra he takes the top of the can of soup and he throws it in the garbage and he eats soup. And that's it. And it was the moment where I realized that the culture on, Rik on Rikers was just so different than any other correctional facility, and that you could actually run a correctional facility that didn't have that sort of culture, where people could go to programming, where people could call their family members, where people could go to recreation, where people could go to college. I went to college while I was in prison, in that very same prison. And yet there were all these moments in prison that I always tried to hold on to. And, and I'll tell you three of them, and then I'll stop. One was the guy who said to me, wow, look at your grades. You should, you should go to college. That didn't happen for me in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn. Didn't happen on Rikers. Happened in prison. The college degree was important. I got to tell you, this person telling me to go to college was equally, if not more so, important. 
No moments like that exist on Rikers Island. There's no compassion on Rikers Island. Even correction officers who came there wanting to do the right thing realize that they put themselves in danger if they show compassion towards the people who are serving time. Two other moments in prison. In New York, when you get transferred from one prison to another, you stay in other prisons on the way up to whatever prison you're going to. And I get to this prison called Auburn, upstate New York, and it's the middle of winter, and I'm in the back of a bus, and I'm shackled with 40 other men, men of color, and we're being delivered to this prison. And we're in this beautiful little town, postcard, and the last thing I remember seeing was this gas station, this just small, quaint Main Street gas station, and then the bus makes a left, and you turn into one of the most foreboding prison walls you've ever seen in your life with tall towers, and it's old, and it's, it, it's, it's weather beaten, and there's these two huge metal doors that are rusted out, and there's like this dark cloud on top and a, like a lightning bolt coming down. Just want to make sure you're paying attention. And, and the bus pulls into the prison, and we're all walking like this, and you're walking slowly, and they start taking the shackles off and putting us all in these cells. And it's a long row of cells similar to Rikers. And I get into the cell. This is, a, this is at the time when New York's prisons were double bunked, meaning as soon as you walk into a cell, there's going to be someone else in that cell. And I walk into the cell, and I hear the door slam behind me. And it's really dark, but I can see a guy sitting on the bottom bunk. And he immediately starts talking to me before I even say hello. And I'm scared to death, but I figure I'm just going to engage him and start talking to him. And within a couple of minutes, I learn his name. His name is Arthur. And we start talking to each other. And it turns out Arthur was convicted of a drug crime when he was 16. He was now 34. Um, he got offered 15 to life. He didn't take it. He went to trial. He ended up with 25 to life. And so he was three quarters of a way into that. So he was still relatively young. I remember the, pale, the, the, the paint peeling off the wall. I remember the windows being open in front of the cells. It was freezing upstate New York. And, and the guards would keep the windows open as a way to just make it even more miserable. You have one thin blanket. And I knew I was going to be with Arthur for three days because I got there on a Friday. And on Saturday morning, I feel my glands start to swell, and I start coughing. And Arthur says to me, he says, you're getting sick. And I was like, yeah, I'm getting sick. And he said, do you want me to make you a cup of tea? And I was like, OK, Arthur. Like when I walked in here, you were talking to yourself. You want to make me a cup of tea? You go right ahead. He was like, OK, well, just look out for the correction officer. And so I get up, and I go to the gate, and I'm looking for the correction officer. And Arthur just jumps up and springs into action. And he takes a bottle like this, and he ties a string to it, and he hangs it from a light fixture in the cell, and he rips the matches off the bunk and leaves the metal part of the cell, asks me to give him the toilet tissue, and he takes the toilet tissue, and he wraps it really tightly and puts it under the bottle. So the bottle now is hanging from a string over the tissue. He takes a pencil and puts it in the outlet in the cell and heats up the lead and lights the toilet tissue on fire. So now the bottle is spinning over the toilet tissue, and it begins to melt. But it doesn't burst, and the water in it begins to boil. And he takes it off the string, and he rips open his lapel, and he pulls out two tea bags, and he puts one of them in the bottle, and he hands me the bottle, the cup of tea. Why do I tell that story? I always tell it. I tell that story all the time. Why? Because here's a person that's in the middle of a system that's meant to crush everything about him, his hope, his dreams his vision, his future, everything. And within 24 hours, he found enough compassion to make me a cup of tea in that cell. But also, for people who have a hard time wrapping their heads around, well, why should we do anything for the perpetrator of a crime? I mean, think about that sort of human capital sitting in our prisons every single day. And so when I think of where to make my investment to undo a place like Rikers, for me, the answer is really easy. Like, we lock up some of America's best and brightest. And until we start telling a new story about who we lock up and why we lock them up, places like this will continue to exist in the most progressive cities in New York with some of the most progressive people going to sleep at night. Because if it's not about author and it's just about inmates and convicts and offenders and prisoners and detainees and all the other language given to us by the system to refer to people in the system, then why should we show compassion? It's not a brother, an uncle, an aunt, 
It's not somebody who has enough compassion to make tea for a person he's just met. And so as you walk away from this conversation that we're going to have today, I want you to think about that. I want you to think about what narratives you have in your own mind about people who get locked up in this country. And how does that get in the way of you exercising whatever privilege you have to undo this? Because I guarantee you, a place like this doesn't shudder unless people who have more privilege than the people who are represented in this film stand up and say, not in my name. And so that's what I hope you take away from tonight, that there are people like me, there are people like the folks in this film fighting hard so that other children don't suffer, so that other 16-year-olds don't end up here. But we don't get to the finish line unless, folk, unless folks like the people in this room decide that this is some place where you're not just going to identify your privilege and step away from it, but you're going to identify it and wield it in the name of justice. Thank you. <laughs>